Well, good evening, everyone. It is wonderful to see all of your beautiful faces. I trust that you are delighted to know that you have brought, been brought safely through another week. Amen. You know, it's nice to know that God put you on the wake up list this morning because some people did not wake up this morning. And unfortunately, sometimes we take that for granted. Also, I wanted to um, just reiterate to each and every one of us that while we are going through these worship services, as my brother mentioned, that worship is not a spectator sport. It's very true. And so be praying in your heart as we are going through God's word tonight, asking God to speak to you personally, you know, asking God to tell you exactly what he wants you to hear. And of course, praying for me that I would surrender to whatever God is impressing upon my heart to say. Doesn't matter what notes and plans you made. If, if God wants to tell you something, he will operate on my mind. Getting a little feedback. Thank you. Perfect. That should be better. So with that being said, shall we pray together? Mighty God, everlasting Father, Lord, none of us are worthy to be here. Lord, you did not wake us up this morning because we are righteous. You woke us up because you have a purpose. And you brought us to this place at this time because there's something specific you want to speak to our souls. Father, we did not come to hear the words of a man, political speeches or philosophy. We've come to hear the word of God, to hear Jesus preached and to be high and lifted up. And so we ask, Lord, that you would use this man who is but dust in your sight, that you would send the sweet, sweet spirit of Jesus to descend upon this place, just as the day of Pentecost. And Lord, that hearts may be convicted and may make a full surrender to the Lord Jesus and his word. Teach us, Lord, how to not only stand up, but to stand out like a good soldier. This is our prayer, and we offer this prayer from our hearts in Jesus' name. Let all of God's people say, Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. When you're there, you can say amen. Okay, if you're not there, just say have mercy. Okay. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 2. As I've potentially mentioned in one of my previous messages, years ago, about 1999, yeah, I guess it was about 20 years ago, I had enrolled or enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. And when I signed up for the Marine Corps, it was never my intention to be in the military. It's never my intention to do that. My intention was to go to college and to pursue my degree. Now, when I did that, the, it, the thing that was interesting was I could have chosen the Army, I could have chosen the Air Force, I could have chosen the Coast Guard, could have chosen the Navy. My father was in the Navy. But I decided to go with the Marines. And a lot of people were thinking of all the branches that you could go to, why would you go to the Marines? Marines are known as the first to fight. So when there's a conflict in America, it's usually Marines that go first. Then after, you know, we do whatever they need us to do, the Army comes in and occupies. So the army is designed for occupying. The Marines are designed to go do what needs to be done so it can be occupied. <laughs> and so I, I signed up for the Marines because it was the most difficult. That's literally why I chose it. It was the longest training and it was the most difficult. They don't just accept anybody who applies. And I found that to be interesting 
And so I said, you know what? I'm trying to get out of the house. I'm trying to get away from home because sometimes your home life is not peaceful. Sometimes you feel like you just need to be out of your house. Anybody feel that way before? Sometimes you feel like you just need to go somewhere else. Well, that's exactly how I felt at 18 years old. And I decided that I'm going to go join and sign up for the United States Marines. And they have their sayings, the few, the proud, the Marines. The interesting thing about the Marine Corps, as opposed to every other branch of the United States military, is even though they have the highest requirements, you can't get in the Marine Corps if you cannot do certain movements. They have something called the duck walk that you have to pass. You have to pass the physical screening. If you cannot do 50 push-ups, you're not getting in. So obviously, it's interesting to note that we also have female Marines as well. Now, their standards are not the same as the males, but I mean, I don't know a lot of women that can do 25 push-ups. And I'm talking about real push-ups, not on your knees, right? Or on a yoga ball. I'm talking about real push-ups. So the girls that get into the Marine Corps are also hardcore. So when you go through this, there's almost a sense of pride, which is why they say the few, the proud, the Marines. And they say once a Marine, always a Marine. Because of what you go through to become one. I want to suggest to you that one of the fundamental tenets of the Marine Corps that is akin to Christianity is that every Marine is a basic rifleman. That means he or she is trained for infantry in actual combat. Hand-to-hand -hand weapons, guns, machine guns, handguns, knives, whatever it is, you are trained to do it. And when they train you in the martial arts, they don't train you like white belts, black belts, all this kind of stuff. They teach you the most deadly forms of every martial art. So we don't want to teach you all there is about Taekwondo. We just want to teach you the deadly kicks. Then in boxing, they don't want to just teach you regular boxing. They just want to teach you the most powerful and dangerous punches. So in going through this whole experience, you have two roles in the Marine Corps. You have what's called your military operation specialty or your MOS. And then you have the fact that you are trained to be infantry. So the reason for this is if the Marines go somewhere, there's going to be a cook. There's going to be a mechanic. There's going to be a pilot. There's going to be someone who's admin, you know, runs the books, cashes paychecks. Someone who's going to be logistics and they're organizing the transport of materials, but it doesn't matter who you are and what your job is. If you come into a Marine Corps camp, every single person from the cook to the person mopping the floor can hit you with a bullet eight out of 10 times from 500 yards. They're trained to do that. So in this sense, every single individual Though they have other jobs and roles and responsibilities, they are also called to be infantry. Ready to fight is what they say. And then when you are going through this training and you get released into the fleet, the most interesting thing, I mean, now it's not very interesting because I'm a Christian and I, I don't want to kill people. But As you're marching at the end, they make you march five miles, one step at a time. And every step that you take, you say one shot, one kill. Then you go a step. Then you say one shot, one kill. Then you go another step for five miles. So you already know what they're trying to do. Get it into your brain. Use this, the least amount of bullets to take out the most life for five miles. Marching one step at a time. One shot, one kill. I believe that though as Christians, just like Marines, we may have other roles and responsibilities in life. You may be an engineer. You may be a media specialist. You may be a marketing person. You may be a nurse, a doctor. You may be a social worker. You may be a teacher. That may be your MOS, so to speak. That's your operation specialty. Maybe you're in charge of Sabbath school. Maybe you're a pastor. But regardless of whatever your role is inside of the branch of service, 
of the Lord. Everyone should be trained to be a soldier. And I want you to listen to Paul's counsel here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. He says, you therefore must endure hardship like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Notice what he says next. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him or called him to be a soldier. I want to give you five qualifications of a good soldier. How many? Five qualifications of a good soldier. Qualification number one. You find it at the end of verse four. The Bible says... No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who called him to be a soldier. The first quality of a good soldier of Jesus Christ is that he answers the call to be a soldier. You see, there was Ernest Shackleton. He was the one that one of the first explorers of Antarctica. And as he was doing this in England, like the 18, 1700s, they said, well, how are you going to get people to go with you to Antarctica? And of course, they had already gotten reports of what it was like on this frozen continent, the frozen tundra, as it was called. And Shackleton said, I'm just going to put an ad in the newspaper. So he takes this ad, and this is what he wrote in the ad. He didn't make it glorious. He didn't make it seem like, oh, yeah, you know, we're going we're gonna to have a amazing, you know, exploration credentials. He says, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, long nights of darkness, safe return, doubtful. He put that ad, and guess what? He had more people than he could even take on the ship. You say, why is that the case? Because when people saw that, and then he said, great reward and recognition if successful. You see, at the end of the day, we understand that great rewards come at great expense. There was Zig Ziglar who made the statement that the chief cause for failure and unhappiness is that people sacrifice what they want most for what they want now. See, when Jesus comes, what you're going to want most is to be inside the gates of the New Jerusalem. But right now, some of us are sacrificing what we want most for what we want now. You think Dubai is a beautiful place? You have not seen the glory in heaven above. The streets are gold. The gates are made of pearls. That's how much pearl God has to spare. I'll just use that as the door. The walls are completely clear. And the foundation is not cement or concrete or some other rock that they found. Twelve foundations made of precious stones. This city is hundreds of miles on each side. And yet and still some of us right now are toying with our eternal destiny. Because we forgot that God has not just called you and I to make money, to be successful, to provide for our families. He has called you and I to be a soldier. That means Christianity is not for the weak. It is not for those who are unwilling to stand and be counted. If there's anyone that knows how to stand alone, it is a soldier. If they drop me off in combat and every other person is killed, I don't retreat because the mission still remains. They said, this is your mission. You don't come back saying, well, I could have accomplished the mission, but this is what I decided to do. Because there is nothing more honorable than to be killed in action. Listen, if I'm going to die, I'm not going to die sitting out here watching movies and Netflix because I killed myself by Netflix binging and eating an unhealthy diet sitting on my couch at home. If I'm going to die, I want to die walking on the battlefield for my Lord. Can you say amen? I don't mind if someone says this brother was preaching the gospel and ended up losing his life. 
I don't mind if they say this brother was preaching the gospel. People got upset because it was affecting their economic ability to make money. I don't mind about that because I wasn't called to be wealthy. I wasn't called to be popular. I wasn't called to be on news and media and have one million followers on Instagram. I was called to be a good soldier. See, notice he adds the adjective good soldier. There's a lot of soldiers, but not every soldier is a good soldier. Some people out here just reaping the benefits of being in the army. You know, people do that. They just sign up for, oh, I'm going to get a sign-on bonus, and I'm going to get this, and they pay you, and you do your 20 years retirement. You get a check for the rest of your life, and if you get injured while you're in, oh, yeah, now you're getting disability plus your retirement check. People just trying to sap from the system. Some of us are doing the same thing with Jesus. See, God did not call us to be participants in church. Christianity, at one time when it was born, it was not for people who were faint-hearted. In a time where you could have been killed because you were baptized. So when he's calling Timothy, just like he's calling each and every one of us tonight, and has been calling you since you went down into the watery graves of baptism. Jesus is looking for soldiers. He's not looking for people who are pansies. He's not looking for people who are weak with no backbone. Can't stand for anything. So in this sense, Jesus says, I'm looking for a good soldier. Because I'm fighting a war against the devil. I'm fighting a war against the powers of darkness. It don't take very far to realize we are in the middle of a battlefield. People are going down to Christless graves. And God is looking for some good soldiers. And if you and I have decided to follow Jesus, then Jesus has called you and me to be a soldier. And guess what? No soldier enters the military expecting a cakewalk. No soldier enters the military expecting to be walking through life on a bed of roses. Because I'm a soldier. Listen, when I got to use the bathroom, I got to dig a hole in the ground. You travel with the food and everything you need on your back. You don't go out there and say, hey, what hotel are we staying in while we're fighting over here in Afghanistan? You a soldier. But you see, it's very easy, Paul says, that we can forget that God has called us not just to be a participant, not just to attend and sit in the back, enjoy the blessings and just coast our way into the kingdom of heaven. He has called us to be a soldier of Jesus. Are you telling me that if Jesus right now was in heaven saying that there's open enlistment in the kingdom of heaven's armies that you wouldn't sign up? How many of us would answer the call? How many of us would allow ourselves to be drafted by the kingdom of heaven? That he says, I'm looking for some good soldiers. And so tonight, God has called us into a time in Dubai that he says, listen, the draft is open. I'm an open recruitment. I'm looking for a good soldier. And if you came here tonight, that means Jesus is calling you to be a soldier. I know you thought God just brought you here to attend another event. You thought that God just brought you here. Oh, I just need a good spiritual upliftment. No, Jesus is in active recruitment for soldiers. The question is, are you going to answer the call? Because the only way to be a good soldier is to answer the call. Otherwise, you won't be a soldier at all. You know, we call people who are non-soldiers civilians. Collateral damage in war. So if you think that not engaging in this warfare, you're going to be spared, you got another thing coming. Because you right now even if you're not actively participating as a soldier of Jesus Christ, you are suffering the blows that come from this warfare. You are going through the trauma and the drama that the devil is bringing to every life. The grim reaper has visited your family. You've been touched by the enemy of death. You've been acquainted with grief. You've been discouraged, broken, broken up with, embarrassed and shamed. You've had people disrespect you. So what makes you think you're going to get an easy walk if you're not a soldier? At least if you're in the war, you got soldiers next to you to fight with. 
at least you're a soldier. You got somebody to go to war with. Because all of a sudden, when you know you're fighting beside other soldiers, you become more confident. Because I know that I'm not alone. Think about the number of people in this room right now. If we were all soldiers, a part of the Lord's army, moving together, understanding that we are all striving for the same mission, and we are following the general, Jesus Christ, do you really think we're going to lose? Do you really think that no matter the number of people in this room compared to the population of the earth, this would be enough people for Jesus to conquer the planet? Let alone Dubai. If we were soldiers and we answered the call. The second quality of a good soldier, Paul says in verse 3, he says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier. See, now he starts getting into where the rubber meets the road. There are some soldiers who answered the call. They came tonight. They've decided to give their life to Jesus. But what makes you a good soldier is your ability to endure hardship. It's to go through something difficult. Jesus said at the end of time that he says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. It's going to get colder and colder and colder. But you see, to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsakes us and to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. We are living in a time where we must learn to gather warmth from the coldness of others. I know what it's like to be in church and feel like people are judging you. I know what it's like to go to church where people don't even give you a chance to explain yourself. They've already decided in your mind who you are. Sometimes the nastiest people are inside the pews. Sometimes the nastiest people are the ones who are leading the church. Sometimes the people that are most unchristian are the ones inside and with positions of responsibility. But guess what? God didn't call me to endure softness. I'm going to be a good soldier because Jesus then said, but he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. That means some people ain't going to be saved because they don't endure because they allow the offense of another church member, another brother and sister to cause them to walk out of the kingdom of God and to cancel their enlistment in Jesus's army. Oh, this person disrespected me. This person offended me. This person slept with my wife. This person slept with my husband. I will be a fool if I think I will give up my eternal salvation because someone else was a knucklehead. Because someone else was caught up in the devil's trap. I'm not going to be lost because you lost. And the sad part is that person may repent and still make it in the kingdom. So I'm not going to be lost because someone else was acting crazy. Because the very fact that I'm suffering pain on this earth, I'm not going to get hell on earth and hell afterwards. Can you say amen? If I'm going to get hell on earth, I'm going to get heaven next. That's what I'm looking forward to. That's going to motivate me to say, no, nah, nobody is ever going to be able to cause me to detour myself from my commitment to Jesus. No one's going to be able to discourage me. No one's going to say, you know what? You ain't coming to church. I love it when people tell me, you know, I don't feel like going to church. Say it's nothing but the devil. Because you know what? I ask people, they say, I don't know what God wants me to do. I said, forget asking what God wants you to do. What do you think the devil wants you to do? Then you just do the opposite then you already know what path you are on. You think the devil wants you to go to church? For sure not. Because he's afraid the pastor might be preaching a message just for you. He's afraid a sister or brother might obey the Holy Spirit and encourage you that Sabbath. So he tells you, go ahead and stay home. I'll catch the service online. It's nothing but the devil. If there is a place where Jesus' name is being uplifted, I'm going to that place. Because I'm not in church for people. I'm in church for Jesus. The word worship means to confess the worthiness of Christ. Is Jesus worthy? Yes or no? Yes. Then you show up. I don't care about the people to my right or to my left. I'm at church because of what Jesus has done for me. So all these other people could have disrespected me, but I'm going to show up because Jesus has been faithful. They might be unfaithful, but I'm still coming. Listen, when you got family drama and we all got family drama, 
But you see, when there's that one person's funeral, when it's that one person's wedding, I don't want to see that person, but guess what? I'm not going to not go to their wedding because of that person. So you guys, well, I'm going to go to the wedding. We, I'm going to sit on this side. They sit on that side. We just stay out of each other's way because we're all here to celebrate that individual. Why can't we do that at church? One of my favorite stories is about these 40 Christians that were worshiping in Rome. They got caught because they were infiltrated by a centurion. Just wanted to catch them in the act of worshiping some other god besides Caesar. As soon as he called the captain and the guards came, he said, sir, what do you want us to do with him? He said, I want you to take them down to the river. Man, so they went down to the river. So when they got down to the river, it was in the dead of winter. He told all the Christians, take off all your clothes. Take them all off. Then he said, I want you to walk into the middle of the river in Rome in the middle of winter. And he says, go ahead and light a fire. Then after they lit the bonfire, he said, now, when you're ready to give your allegiance to Caesar and to abandon Jesus, you can come and warm yourself by the fire. But we're going to stand right here all night. So what are you guys going to do? So there was the 40 men caught worshiping Jesus, sitting in a freezing river in the middle of winter in Rome. Do you think people were just signing up to become a Christian? Do you think there was any half-hearted Christians in there? Knowing this was the possibility. So while they were there sitting in the silent of night in Rome, freezing in that river, one of the men started singing a song. He said, 40 men of God are we, faithful forever we shall be. And as he sang, another one caught it, then another one caught it. All 40 of them are singing. 40 men of God are we, faithful forever we shall be. They kept singing. They kept singing. They kept singing it over and over and over again. And just after about two hours, one of the men left the circle and started going for the fire. They said, no, brother, don't. So he bowed down and knelt by that fire, and he gave his allegiance to Caesar. They wrapped him in a blanket, and he sat by. And they started singing again. 39 Men of God are we. Faithful forever we shall be. 39 men of God are we. Faithful forever we shall be. And all of a sudden, they saw some rustling right there next to the fire. They thought maybe the brother had second-guessed himself. He was going to come back. But it actually wasn't the man that defected. It was actually the Roman captain. Started taking off all his clothes putting down his shields and his Roman insignia. And he walked into the water and said, no, 40 men of God are we faithful forever. We shall be. He died in that river. And do you know why he crossed it? Because he said, these men are willing to die. There's no way they're believing in fables. There's no way this is just guesswork. There's no way that they're just following the religion of Jesus simply because of an idea or on a whim or pie in the sky by and by. Maybe I'm going to have this. They believed it all the way unto death. They counted it a privilege to suffer for Jesus because like a good soldier, they were willing to endure hardness. See, the real soldiers were not on the shore fully clothed with their fur jackets. The real soldiers were in the river. You think you're tough because you're a centurion? Come stand in here and freeze till you die. They were more faithful to their general, Jesus, than the others were faithful to Caesar. God has called us to endure hardness. Listen, right now, I know there are people in this room who are going through a difficult time. I know that the devil is making a mess in your life. I know there's some people who have hurt you, some people you are not interested in talking to or talking about, some individuals that you're finding it a struggle to forgive. People you are just, I don't know how I'm going to move forward for what this person has done to me. I don't know what to do in my financial situation. I don't know what to do with the disease and illness that is wreaking havoc in my family. Whatever the difficulty is, Remind yourself right now, I'm enduring hardness like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Yes, I may be discouraged. Yes, I may shed tears. Yes, I may go through a difficult time. 
But guess what? Jesus called me to be a good soldier. And I'm going to endure it. I may cry. I may weep. I may need help. I may need a word of encouragement, but I'm not leaving Jesus. I'm going to stand in this cold river, and I'm going to be faithful to Christ. I'm going to stand up, and if I'm the only one, I'll be happy to stand out. Like a good soldier. Third quality of a good soldier, the Bible says in verse 4, he said, no one engaged in warfare. I want to pause there. See, a good soldier is actually active in the war. He's actually active in the battle between Christ and Satan. I don't know why people think that they could get baptized into the church and have no desire for missionary work. Every true disciple of Jesus is born a missionary. If you and I are not missionaries, we are mission fields. It is because we are unconverted. It is because we have not experienced the power of the grace of Jesus Christ, why we are not burdened to share that grace with others. Knowing that Christ has lifted us when we were far from the peaceful shore, sinking deep in sin, knowing that the love of Jesus lifted us, how can you sit there content with your own salvation? How can you say, well, at least I'm saved. At least I'm going to the kingdom and let other people perish in the deep waters of temptation. Knowing that you have an antidote for the problem of sin that is wreaking havoc in their life. No soldier who is a good soldier just sits back while the warfare is going on. He feels like he has to get involved in the battle. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, you see, the difference of fighting in a battle with Jesus is that when you are following the general, when you are out there on the battlefield for your Lord, you're going to see some miracles you would never see sitting at home. You're going to see God do amazing things that you thought in your mind, this, you can't even make this up. I'm going to tell you the truth. It was years ago, I was, I remember I was going door to door doing ministry. And I'll never forget, I came to this one street and God was impressing me through the Holy Spirit. Sebastian, you need to go to this house. So I rolled down this street, past the house. I said, well, let me start at the end of the street. So when I got to the end of the street, all of a sudden I saw these big dogs come out. I was like, oh, no. Nah. Because people say, well, Sebastian, you know, you're afraid of dogs. I'm not afraid of dogs. I'm afraid of what I will do to a dog <laughs> if the dog attacks me. So my wife always jokes about that. She says, you always tell people that. I said, babe, you don't want to find out if it's true. Because I grew up running from dogs as a kid in Chicago. People got loose Rottweilers and Doberman Pinchers and all this stuff just running loose in the neighborhood. From six years old, I'm running from these big old dogs, bulldogs and stuff. So eventually you get tired of running. You're like, man, it's time to put this dog down. It's like, let's go. <laughs> it's like, if you're going to bite me, you're going to bite me. I'm going to get some hits in. And at least I'm going to survive. So I'm, I'm going to this house. I see these big dogs, St. Bernard, you know, big old German shepherd dog. I'm like, oh, man, this is. I don't know if I could take three dogs at the same time. So I roll out, put the car in reverse. I said, no, nah, Lord, I'm not going to this house. So I drive past the house again. Holy Spirit is there knocking me upside the head. You need to go back to that house. I'm like, no, nah, Lord. So I'm resisting the Holy Spirit not wanting to engage in the warfare. So then finally, I said, you know what, fine, I'm going to get out. So I go to the house, knock on the door. This house didn't even have grass. They didn't even have steps to the front door. I was like, man, I don't even know if these people, <laughs> they ain't even pay for grass or even steps to the front door. For sure they can't afford these books. So I'm already fighting the Holy Spirit. I'm already discouraging myself before I even get it. So I knock on the door. The lady says, come to the garage. She's in the window. So I go to the garage. She comes out the garage door. I said, ma'am, you know, I'm, I'm working with the Blue Bible Story Company. Da, 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 da. And you can tell I'm, my heart's not in it. So I'm like, yeah, ma'am, you know, these books are like $400. You think you can, you know, you think you can uh, afford that? You know, I'm not even looking her in the eye. She's like, um, can you come back tomorrow? So guess what I say as the faithful Christian, right? Out in missionary work. Oh, man, we don't come back. That's what I told her. Man, we don't come back. This is your only chance. 
right? Using sales tactics. Today is the day. <laughs> but there's more, right? If you sign up today. So I'm over here like this lady's like, please just come back tomorrow. I promise I will be here. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm saying this is people's excuses. They tell you come back tomorrow, then they go on vacation, right? <laughs> then you back at hello, no one's home, right? Everything's dark. So I went home. I said, see, Lord, I told you. So the next day I'm driving by that street. The Holy Spirit said, you need to go back to the house. I'm like, no, Lord, people are never there. It's always a waste of time. I'm trying to save your time, right? You got me out here doing missionary work. Let me not waste time. The Holy Spirit, go back to the house. Go back to the house. So finally I'm like, fine. You know what? I'm going to show you. So I walk out of the car, right? I got all the books. I'm like, you know what? Since you want me to go to this, I'm going to present everything. I guarantee she's not interested. So I, I, just before I knock on the door, she opens the door. She was waiting for me. She says, come inside. Meet me in the kitchen. So then I get to the kitchen. I'm like, okay, okay, Lord. I see, I see what you're doing. Then I look on the counter. Has a blank check already signed. So I was like, oh, okay. Let me take all the books out. So I'm ready. I'm like, okay, I got 15, 16, 18 books. Okay, so I put all the books on the counter. I'm ready to do my little canvas. She comes back in the kitchen. She says, I want to buy everything you have. I'm like, did you want to see the book? She's like, no, no, I want everything. Is that everything? Do you have any more in the car? I'm like, yeah, I mean, I got some more in the car, but I mean, this is everything. She, she says, how much? I was like, uh, $699 for everything. She says, all right, fills the check out, hands me the check. She says, now I just have one question for you. Sure, you can ask me anything, right? You just wrote me a check, $700. What, what do you want to know? She said, are you an angel? I said, no. She says, no, I'm serious. Are you an angel? I'm like, ma'am, I'm not an angel. She's like, are you 100% sh sure you're not an angel? I said, you can ask my mom. Right? <laughs> my mom will tell you, I am not an angel. <laughs> so then she begins to tell me, she says, listen, I just moved into this house two weeks ago. I was living at a different house. And at that house I was living at for the past year, she said, I had a dream and I was talking to an angel and I couldn't see the angel's face. Then I woke up thinking it was a dream, but the angel was at the foot of my bed. So I went to sit up and the angel went out the window. So I got off the bed, ran to the window. The angel zipped. I couldn't see anything. And she says, when I put my head back inside, there was a smell in the room I've never smelled before. So she said, man, that, that must be the smell of the angel. So she started trying to find the smell. Every cologne, every perfume, every lotion, every flower she could possibly find to find. She said she could never find the smell until yesterday. She said, when you knocked on my door and I opened the door, I thought you were a salesman and then you had the smell. She says, I was so confused. I didn't even know what to say. So she said, I thought in my mind, if it's truly an angel from God, he'll come back tomorrow. And I was about to not come back. You see how you miss your blessings? When you're not engaged in the warfare. She said, even right now, you got the smell. Are you sure you're not an angel? I'm like, ma'am, I'm telling you, I wish I was an angel. <laughs> I would go right back to heaven. I wouldn't be knocking on your door in this heat. <laughs> so we prayed together. Bible studies, you know, this lady became interested and started seeking the Lord. Because you're engaged in the warfare. These are the type of experiences that continue to confirm your faith when you are engaged in the battle. See, right now, if you're praying for a soul to get to know Jesus, you're engaged in the battle. If right now you're trying to share the good news with a brother, a co-worker, a family member, a friend, you're engaged in the battle. The devil is scared. The devil is trembling. That's why he's bringing difficulties into your life. Because he wants you to give up the fight. But you see, a good soldier engages in the warfare. Doesn't get caught up into the next quality of a good soldier. Know what he says? He says, no one engaged in the warfare entangles himself with the affairs of 
of this life. It's quality number four. I was preaching in a place I'm not going to name. After I was preaching here, this particular place, this young lady had a very troubled past. She'd been through a lot. I don't even want to mention it up front. So in the afternoon, we're, we're sitting here talking, myself and a whole bunch of young adults. She said, Elder Sebastian, I want to ask you a question. Sure. She said, um, so I'm a dancer. I said, okay. What's, what's, what's going on? No, no, I'm not that kind of dancer. I'm like a dancer. Like I dance for money. Most dancers like to make money. She said, no, no, I'm a dancer you know, like a pole and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, really? This is in front of the whole group. So this girl's not even ashamed. She says, and tonight, Saturday night, is my biggest night where I make the most money. So I want to know, what do you think I should do? She has two kids. So she's like, you know, Ali, I got to be able to pay my bills. I got to be able to provide. And Saturday night's when I make most of my money. What should I do? Because she said, you know, tonight, I know you have a program. I know you're preaching. You're doing something else. But I need to go to work and make this money. I said, sister, do not allow yourself to ever believe that you got to do the devil's errands in order to make the money that already belongs to God. God said, I own a cattle on a thousand hills. All the silver and gold is whose? Is mine. Do you think God who brought taxes out of a fish's mouth cannot pay your bills? Do you think a God that caused ravens, the most selfish bird in nature, they don't even feed their own young at times, but they fed Elijah by the brook carrot. That same God could lead the most selfish people to feed you. So I said, listen to me, sister, God has a thousand ways to provide for you of which you know, not one. So I said, you better not go tonight. Because if you're going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot be entangled with the affairs of this life. Caught up worrying about paying your bills, you're not even faithful to your covenant with Jesus. She said, are you sure? I said, I couldn't be more sure of anything in my life. So I said, you know what? I'm going to text you tonight. Give me your phone number. I'm going to text you tonight and ask you if you win. She said, okay, 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 fine. So I texted her just when I got back to my host home. I sent her a text, said, sister, I hope you're at home. Meeting just finished, right? Because I thought she was going to come to the meeting and then go after the meeting. So I hope you went straight home. Amen. No response. So I prayed. I said, Lord, you can break down vehicles. You can cause roads to be closed. (laughs) Keep this sister faithful to what she said. Go to sleep. Wake up the next morning with a text message. Text message said, Elder Sebastian, I need to talk to you right away. I said, okay. I'm thinking, all right. Could be good news. Could be bad news. She gives me a call and she says, you won't believe it. I said, what won't I believe? <laughs> she said, I didn't go last night. I said, hallelujah. Praise God. She said, I went straight home, put my kids to bed and went to sleep not knowing what I was going to do. But she says, I woke up this morning and she said, you know, I told God, Lord, I did what you asked me to do. So, you know, help me provide for my kids and for my home and for my family. Right. Amen. Right. She does that. So she starts thinking, well, you know what? Let me at least start with my finances and see what I can do to balance my budget. She goes to check her bank account. Thousand dollars deposited that morning from an anonymous individual. She said, you know, the thing that made me tremble was because you said God had a thousand ways. And she says, in the very next morning, a thousand dollars appeared in my account. Listen to me, brothers and sisters, when you and I make a decision to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Do not allow yourself to give up the mission just because of the affairs of this life, just because you're trying to pay off school fees. Just because you're trying to send money back home, do not surrender and compromise your integrity to provide for the affairs of this life. I used to live in Dubai. I know some people are working on the Sabbath. 
in order to make money. And if your job is not going to give you the Sabbath off, you got to find another job. And if that means you got to go back where you came, then you got to go back. Because guess what? I'm not going to sacrifice my integrity and my faithfulness to Jesus simply for a few dollars. I went to the mall in Dubai. I remember I was talking to a lady and she said, oh, you know, if you if you work with me and use me, I'll give you a discount. I said, oh, OK, praise the Lord. So now I looked at the price. I'm like, man, you know, she said 240 Durham. I'm like, man, that's a little high, don't you think? She says, no, no, I'll give you a discount. So we start going through everything at the end of it. Right. It's like 220 Durham. I'm like, I mean, this is like a few dollars off. She was like, brother, do you know where you are? This is what the lady said to me. She says, you're in Dubai. It's about the Durhams. So, yes, I gave you a discount, but I still need to get paid. I was like, I mean, we sat here for an hour thinking you was going to give me a substantial discount. <laughs> a couple Durham ain't doing nothing. She says, do you want it or not? I was like, I mean, it's all right. <laughs> I was like, I'll go somewhere else. Thinking, right, she would try to bring me back and say, oh, I'll give you more of a discount. No, she said, all right, you have a good evening. She said, this is Dubai. We about the Durham's brother. Told me straight to my face. You get caught up in that mindset, in this place, you're going to find yourself entangled in the affairs of this life. And when you're entangled, you ain't got time to fight. You don't have all your hands, you don't have all your weapons ready to go. Because your hands are tied. And notice, it doesn't say someone else entangled you, it says entangled himself. See, most of us are in the situation we're in right now because of ourselves. Nobody put your gun to your head and told you to take that job. No one told you to get into that relationship. No one told you to buy that car, to go shopping for all those clothes. No one told you to choose that apartment. So much of the situation that we are in right now, we entangled ourselves. And he says a good soldier does not entangle himself or herself with the affairs of this life. Listen, I know we all are trying to find a way to make a way out of no way. I know exactly what that's like. I grew up poor. I remember what it's like to not have the lights on, to not have running water in America. People looking at, and I remember I used to tell my dad when I find we moved to a new neighborhood, it was the first time I realized we were poor. Went to some girl's birthday party. I said, man, this is a nice house. She says, oh, this is the house we only use for parties. Wait, you have a house just for parties? <laughs> She's like, oh, yeah, this is not my house. I'm thinking like basement, four or five bedrooms. I'm like, so this is your extra house? She's like, yeah. She's like, only when family come in town, they stay here. So I came home. I was like, Ma, are we poor? <laughs> My mom was like, what? Why are you asking me that? Because that house you took me to for the birthday party, that's not even her house. That's her extra house. Do we have an extra house? We ain't got no extra house. My dad used to say the good thing about going, growing up poor is you know what you can live without. You were living. You may not have had all these other bells and whistles, but you were living. So don't start tripping now, Sebastian. You a business owner. You making all this money. Don't forget what you can live without. You didn't need that then. All the matching clothes and shoes and name brand this and name brand that. People got Louis Vuitton chair covers in their car. What you need a Louis Vuitton chair cover in your car? A floor mat. It's like, oh yeah, I got this Coco Chanel floor mats for your car. I'm like, this don't even make no sense. Chanel is a, fit, a fashion brand. Oh, no, they gave me a free mat, you know, for my trunk to cover the back. I'm like, this, how much did you pay for that? Oh, yeah, this thing was like four or five hundred bucks for a mat in the trunk. And not today, Satan. I was like, no way. <laughs> I was like, the devil got somebody. You pay five hundred dollars for a mat in the trunk, in the boot, whatever you want to call it. A mat, because <laughs> it got two C's on it. <laughs> I was like, 
I'm, I'm confused. But this is how we get entangled in the affairs of this life. And it keeps us back from being a good soldier. I know my time is pretty much out, but I got one more. He says at the end of verse four, he says that he may please him who called him to be a soldier. The fifth quality of a good soldier is he or she does everything to please Jesus. Listen, if you're going to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, you got to ask yourself, did I enter into this relationship to please Jesus or to please me? That's a good soldier. To please him who called him to be a soldier. Because guess what? It's a privilege to be in the Lord's army. But our mindset and our focus is not about pleasing Jesus. It's pleasing ourselves. And that's why Paul said to Timothy, going into the next chapter, he said, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. What do you mean, Timothy? You're talking about wars and rumors of wars? He says, no, men shall be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. It's not that they don't love God, they just love pleasure more. And he doesn't mean pleasing Jesus, he means pleasing yourself. See, that is the motivation as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to sleep with this man, this is not going to please Jesus. I'm not going to marry this woman, this is not going to please Jesus. I'm not taking that job. Jesus would not be pleased. I'm not going to say these words to this person. I'm not going to disrespect this individual. I'm not going to go ahead and pay money for this and that and the third. Is that going to please Jesus? That's a good soldier. Do you know how many foolish situations that desire will keep you from? How many bad decisions, if your single eye to the glory of God, will keep you from a foolish decision? Just because you ask a simple question, will this please Jesus? People say, well, how do you know what's going to please Jesus? It's right here. Check this book. Will Jesus be pleased? Let me see. Has anyone else made this type of decision in the Bible? Has anyone else considered this? But you see, that's why you got to rejoice. You came to this meeting tonight, and it pleases Jesus. You took the time. You could have been somewhere else. You could have gave in to the laziness, stayed home, catch the recordings later. There's all kind of choices you made, but you made the choice to come, and it pleases Jesus. And you know what's ironic? is when we do the thing that pleases Jesus, it ends up pleasing ourselves. That's the irony of it all. Because Jesus understands what true happiness is about. He knows what true pleasure is about. Because the pleasures that Jesus provides, the Bible says, in his hand are pleasures forevermore. There's no guilt after you have it. See, a lot of the pleasures we pursue, guilt is waiting on the other side. You say, yeah, I got into the front seat of pleasure, but guilt is riding in the front seat. You know, God doesn't have pleasure that comes with guilt. We need to focus on pleasing Jesus if we're going to be a good soldier. You know, I'll never forget when we finish the Marine Corps basic training, you go through something called the crucible. And the crucible is a crucible. <laughs> it's four days. You only get enough food for one day and a half. You got about 35 kilos on your back and you walk somewhere, you know, around 100 to 120 kilometers, four days. You walk everywhere, no transportation. So as you're going, and you only sleep four hours a day. So I remember going through this, the first day we started, someone stole my food. So I only had enough food for one day. So the last three days, I could not eat. Four hours of sleep, hiking, you know, anywhere from like 10, 20 kilometers a day, probably more than that. And I remember the last day, they wake you up at four o'clock in the morning. 
because you go to bed at, at midnight, wake you up at four. I was exhausted. And I remember we're walking down and all of a sudden he tells us, he says, listen, as we're heading in to this big space, it's called the parade deck. He says, you know, the general is coming. So you're going to meet the general. I was like, okay, here we go. So we get there, and then as we're marching down, he brings us all into formation, and he looks at us, he says, parade, rest. Right, so you stand, boom, parade, rest. I remember I'm, I'm talking to my, my other um, recruit. They won't call you Marines until you're a Marine. They call you a recruit. <laughs> so I said, hey, man, they said don't lock your legs because if you lock your legs and you pass out, while the general is talking, you have to do the whole crucible all over again. So I said, oh, man, you know, so you got to make sure you're bouncing your legs. And then the guy asked me, he says, Braxton, he says, when the general comes, you know, and they tell you like, yeah, you know, we're going to be officially Marines. He's like, are you going to cry? I'm like, bro, I've been here for like three months <laughs> going through all this. No, I'm not going to cry. I'm a Marine. I'm like, why? Are you feeling a little teary eyed? You going to cry? He's like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm just checking. So all of a sudden the general comes, he gives his whole speech. You are the fittest soldiers in the world, right? He's trying to rouse you all up. The most difficult, arduous training on the earth, right? Da, 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 da. These are the battles that we've won, right? He's, he's celebrating this whole thing. Then all of a sudden, right, all of our little drill instructors, they come in. And so I see the guy come in front of my friend. And he's like, oh, attention, boom. So my friend snaps to attention. Then he salutes him. Then he says, at ease, right? So he steps. And then he starts putting on his rank, on his collar of his shirt. He's saying something. I can't hear what he's saying. He steps back. He says, good morning, Marine. My friend breaks down and starts crying. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, this dude is like weeping. His whole body is like trembling and stuff, right? He's crying. So finally, he comes back around and he comes to me. He says, good morning, Braxton. You know, attention, boom. Right, snap to attention. And he's like, okay, at ease, at ease, right? He starts putting on the rank. He says, Braxton, you're going to be a good Marine. You know, this is why I was hard on you. You know, blah, 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 blah. My military specialty was leadership. So he's like, listen, you're going to be a good leader. Blah, 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 blah. He steps back, salutes me. He says, good morning, Marine. I broke down, started crying. <laughs> I was like, what happened? So afterwards, they give you a week. It's called transition week. So you get to act like a normal human being. Eat breakfast when you want. You know, people treat you like a human. So no push-ups every other, you know, 10 seconds. So we get there, and we're going to eat. And my friend, we're sitting there, we get our food, right? And you can tell there's like tension, right? We, will, we both want to ask the other person. It's like, hey, man, why did you cry? He's like, why did you cry? I'm like, you first, you know. So then he's like, you know what? And I totally agreed with what he said. He said, you know, when he saluted me and he said, good morning, Marine. He said it was like in a flash of a moment, every single time I wanted to quit came back to my mind. And he says, I just broke down. I was overwhelmed. He's like, finally, I did it. I'm a Marine. And I was like, it's so true. The times where I remember they made me do push-ups for seven hours straight. I was sweating so much that through my clothes, you could see a silhouette of my body in sweat on the floor. Inside of my leg, outside of my leg, shoulders, you could see my hands in sweat. And he said, Sebastian, I'm going to make you push until your heart bursts. That's what he told me. I remember one time they made me crawl on my elbows two miles on concrete. He said, just go. I remember going there, rubbing my elbows into that concrete, scraping my arms. I remember the pain, every elbow forward. And he says, if you slow down, I'm going to make you start over. So you're going through these things and you're thinking to yourself, why did I even sign up for this, right? Like, what was I thinking? And you wanted to give up. And they're asking you. They're saying, it's okay if you're not cut out to be a Marine. Just quit. Just go ahead. Just tell me. We'll call mama. She'll come pick you up. 
It's what they tell you. They're like, that's why we call you recruit, because you're not a Marine yet. You got to earn it. And immediately in that moment, as I reflected on that, I wasn't a Christian when that happened. But see, when I became a Christian and I understood Bible prophecy, we are about to go through our own crucible. We are about to go through a time of trouble and difficulty, of delay, of deprivation, of denial. A time where people just want to quit and give up. Right at the very end. Think about it. I was three days away from being a Marine. Didn't a minute pass till I thought, maybe I should just quit. After all this time. And as we go through our own crucible, through a time of trouble, the Bible says, that never was since there was a nation. One day, brothers and sisters, we're going to be marching, not down to a parade deck, but the Bible says to a sea of glass. And we're not going to meet the general. We're going to meet the king. And when you get to that parade deck, and Jesus comes out himself, he looks over this vast multitude of people. And he says, you have been faithful. You don't have to ask me if I'm going to cry. When Jesus steps in front of me, and your first impulse is to bow, is to kneel. And he says, stand up. And he tells the angel, pass me that crown. It's not putting on rank. It's going to put a crown on top of your head. And he's going to say, good morning, your majesty. And when it's all said and done, the reason why you and I are going to cry is because we're going to remember those moments where we didn't think we were going to make it. We're going to remember those moments where we weren't taking one second with Jesus in his word. We're going to remember those moments where we were discouraged and we were wondering, does Jesus even care? Is he real? Maybe I should give up on this Christian thing. But when you pass through the portals of that gate and Jesus puts that crown upon your head and says, you have been faithful. When you and I both know we have not been faithful. And that's why it doesn't end the way that Marine Corps graduation ends. Because see, at the end in heaven, it's not going to be, yes, we're walking around with our chest out, crying because we finally made it. No, we're going to take those crowns off of our heads. And we're going to put them at the feet of Jesus. Because we're going to know, I'm not here in the kingdom of heaven as a soldier, because I was faithful. I'm here in the kingdom because you were faithful. Because when I wanted to quit, when I wanted to yield, when I had temptations and sins and struggles, I thought I would never overcome. Jesus was present. Jesus gave me the grace to go on. Jesus is the one that encouraged me to keep going. He's the one that sent tokens of his love, of his grace, of his support. Constant reminders. I never left you in this battlefield by yourself. You keep going, child of God. Because when that day comes, I promise you, it will be worth it. Paul says, listen to me. If we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified together. And that this light affliction. You think your situation is heavy? You think your burdens are weighing you down? Paul says this is a light affliction compared to the eternal weight of glory that God is going to pour down upon your head. A glory that you would be tempted to worship if you saw it right now. That's the kind of glory that's coming to us if we learn and accept the call to be a good soldier.
So I read the New Jerusalem newspaper this morning and I found an ad. It said men and women wanted for a hazardous journey. Safe return guaranteed may involve long nights of darkness. You may pass through the valley of the shadow of death, but you will make it. You may not be able to fly, but you'll be able to run. You may not be able to run, but you'll be able to walk. You may not be able to walk, but you'll be able to crawl. And even when you feel like you can't crawl, God is going to keep you moving and he's going to carry you. But if we stick with Jesus as a good soldier, he's going to take us there. He's going to take us to that mountaintop called Mount Zion. And when we cross that line, it's going to be worth it. I told you last night, my four-year-old daughter looked at me on the phone right before she was crying. She said, Papa, I miss you. When are you coming home? People think traveling and preaching is glorious. It's hard to leave that little girl at home. To know that my youngest daughter wouldn't even look at me when I got out the car. Because she knew what it meant. He's leaving. And the only thing that makes it worth it is to know what I just said. That Jesus is going to look me in the eye and say, Sebastian, you've been faithful. And while you're doing my work, and while you're trying to be a good soldier, I'm going to take care of that little girl. I'll make sure she makes it. While you labor for my children, I'll labor for your children. I would want nothing more than to stay home and make sure she knew every single day of every moment of her life that I love her more than life itself. But God has called me to be a soldier. So it's hard. It gets lonely. You get discouraged. But he called me to endure hardness as a good soldier. God is calling us to be soldiers. I've been doing this for 17 years. There's days you get tired. But then I'm reminded, you better answer the call, Sebastian. And you better keep going. Even if no one else, you keep fighting the good fight. Are you going to answer the call to be a good soldier? Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. <clears throat> My invitation is very simple. God is calling young men and young women to answer his call to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. If you're willing to answer Jesus' call tonight, I want to invite you to stand to your feet. You say, yes, Lord. I'm going to answer your call to be a good soldier of Jesus. I'm going to press on even when it's hard. I may have tears in my eyes, but I'm going to keep doing and fighting the good fight of faith. You say, Lord, I'm willing to answer the call to be a soldier.
my last invitation is for that person who says, right now I'm entangled with the affairs of this life. I've entangled myself and I don't know how to unravel this situation. And so you want Jesus' help. I want you to come to this altar because I'm going to pray for you tonight. You may not know how to untangle yourself, but Jesus knows how to untangle your situation. I want you to come because I'm going to pray for you. You say, Lord, I've entangled myself with the affairs of this life. There are things in my life that are preventing me from serving Jesus the way that I know he wants me to serve him. I want you to come because I'm going to pray for you. Jesus wants to free you so that you can serve him. That's what he did to the Israelites in Egypt. He will send plagues. He will break the heart of a Pharaoh in order to let you serve him. Come, come. Come all the way over. It's okay. Come all the way over. You need to make room. Come closer. Make room. We have people that want to come. I want to make sure they make it up to this altar. Come quickly. Say, Lord, I'm entangled with the affairs of this life, and I need Jesus' help. Come. Come all the way over. It's okay. Don't worry about the camera. You just come up. There's plenty of good room. Jesus will hear every single case that we bring to him. Yes, come over this way. Come, come, come. Plenty of space. Come, come, come. Over here. You can come right in front of me. Plenty of space. Know what it's like to be caught up and to not see a way out. But God has a thousand ways. You do what is right because it is right. And you leave the consequences with God. Don't worry about the fallout. That's not your business because you're doing his business. He will take care of the rest. But we got to answer the call. And that's why we're here tonight. Lord, untangle me from the affairs of this life. I got myself in this mess. I own it. But I need your help. And Jesus' promise is, if you and I come to him, he will not cast us out. He will not say, you know what? That's your own fault. Good luck with that. That's not what Jesus does. He loves us too much. He will free us from whatever the circumstances are. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we stood to our feet because we have answered your call to be a good soldier. Lord, we want to be that soldier that answers the call. We want to be that soldier that is able to endure hardness. Lord, we want to be a soldier that's engaged in the warfare active on the battlefield for our Lord, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ, helping people find victory over sin and over Satan and over the grave. Father, we have answered the call to not entangle ourselves with the affairs of this life. And so tonight, some of us have come to this altar, Lord, to put our situations before you, like Hezekiah to spread it out before the Lord. Lord, you know every situation of every face at this altar. Lord, you've known it for a long time. This is not a surprise to you. This is not news to you. But Lord, they've come now in a position and in a heart of surrender. And so it is my prayer on their behalf that Jesus, you would do for them what they cannot do for themselves. That you would unravel this situation, remove all the perplexity, and have them make a resolute decision in their minds that I'm going to choose to make the work and the service of Jesus supreme in my life, and I will find a plain path before my feet. And Lord, when you open the doors, give them the courage to walk through, not mindful of tomorrow, but thankful for the deliverance of today. 
And last but not least, Lord, may everything we do be to please you. Forgive us, Lord, for how much time we spend pleasing ourselves. Teach us how to be better pleasers of Jesus. This is our prayer. And we trust that you will help this to be our experience as we offer this prayer from our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.